Hi, thanks for joining us today. My name is Christy Klinger, and I'm a pharmacist as well as a certified diabetes educator. And I was asked today to talk about medications because medications is kind of one of those most confusing things that patients and doctors deal with. So my history is, I, I told you I'm a pharmacist, and I started working with the Indian Health Service over in Arizona uh, with the White Mountain Apaches, and then I moved down to San Carlos. And with those programs, I was working with a special diabetes program for Indians. So I'm very familiar with that, that program and all the, the wonderful things they offer. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, I came here to Zuni. And my role here at Zuni is I'm a pharmacist, and I see patients in between their primary care provider visits. So typically someone with diabetes will see their primary care provider every three months. And then I'm the person that's um, doing a lot of in-between phone calls and visits with patients to figure out, you know, if they're on the best medicines that they can be on to give them the most chance of success. Um, and also, you know, just kind of helping move along therapy because a lot of times we get stuck waiting for that next appointment to happen. Or I also problem solve if there's any problems that come up with the patients in terms of side effects. So that's my role. And like I was saying, medicines tend to be one of the most confusing parts of diabetes management. And so hopefully today what we'll talk about is just some of the more practical aspects of helping you know what's out there and figuring out what this for either yourself, your family, or your patient. Okay, so a lot of times when I talk about diabetes, I actually like to point out that it's not just about blood sugar. Diabetes is actually a blood vessel disease. And the reason why we're so focused on those numbers is we know that if we can get people down into a safe range, then what we're doing is we're actually saving and protecting their blood vessels. So everybody is always afraid of their eyes and their kidneys and their feet and getting them to understand that what that A1C number, it's a three month number that tells us on average where the blood sugar has been. And just making sure that they understand that if we can get that number from a 14 to a 9, there's a lot of protection in that. And then if later on we can get that 9 to a 7, there's even more protection in that. So, again, that's one place where I usually like to start. And everybody does tend to be very concerned about their eyes and their kidneys and their, their, their feet. So focusing on that instead of necessarily the number and then also talking about A1C as in the being in the the danger zone versus not or in the versus in the protection zone. And I have a table on the right side here and that's really to kind of help demonstrate that yeah, I'm a pharmacist and I talk a lot about medicines, but I also can't ignore the fact that physical activity and healthy eating are also very important parts of diabetes management. So, we do focus on those as well. And I always say without the the three legs of your table, if you only have two of those legs, there's a good chance your table is going to fall over. So when we talk about diabetes medicines, it gets very confusing because people are always, I think, a little overwhelmed by the number of medicines that are out there. And so it gets very confusing. And so what we're going to talk about here is really the main families of medicine. And when patients see this and when you see these, these medicines, it's usually on a TV commercial. And they're usually talking about brand names. And in the medical world, we tend not to do that so much. Number one, because when you do it, you're kind of advertising for the company. And number two, there's a lot in that name of that generic medicine. And so you can kind of think of the end part of what that, that gene generic medicine name is, kind of like the last name. My last name is Klinger, but my first name is Christy. Um, and so as we go through and talk about some of the different families, I'm really going to focus on that last name, okay? So there's a couple of medicines, though, that they're kind of the only ones in the class that we use. So up in the left-hand corner, the biguanides, the really the only one we use is metformin. And the TZDs, um, the other name for that is thiazolidinedione, and the only one that we use on that is pioglitazone. But then we get over to sulfonylureas. And some of the ones that might be more familiar are glipizide or gliburide. But you see how the, the last part of that is very similar. Down at the DPP-4s, most of those end in glyptin. So whether it's linagliptin, saxagliptin, allogliptin, glyptin is the last name. Okay, so there's a lot of information in that. 
And so that's why we tend, even though the generic names tend to be really big and not quite as catchy as the brand names, that's why we do focus on those. The GLP-1 agonists usually end in glutides, so liraglutide, semaglutide, dulaglutide. And then the SGLT-2 inhibitors generally end in flozin, so canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and empagliflozin. And I might have said those a little wrong. That's generally how I say them, though. Um, and then we also have the insulin classes, and those generally fall into two different categories. We have the long-acting insulin. Another name for that is basal or once-a-day insulin. We also have short-acting insulins, and we sometimes call those bolus or mealtime insulins. And many of these medicines do come together in combination products, and a lot of times that has to do with metformin with pioglitazone, or metformin plus one of the sulfonylureas, or metformin plus one of the DPP-4 inhibitors. So again, if we focus on the generic names, that kind of helps a little bit with us knowing what we're talking about. And there are a few other medicines that I don't have listed on this slide. And the, the reason is because they do not really pay, play a major role in diabetes therapy, and so I will not be discussing them today. We're gonna really focus on the, the main ones. And in general, when we talk about the medications and the algorithms that we follow, this one is an example, this is the one that is used by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, or ACE for short. And one of the things you'll notice when you look at this is they do tend to be a little stricter with their treatments. So anytime someone is over an A1C of 6.5, you're going straight for medicine. Um, and they kind of are a little more lenient in terms of what that first medicine is. It could be metformin. In most cases, it probably should be. Um, but if they have something else going on, they might choose another medicine. And then when you move to the center of the screen where it says entry A1C greater than or equal to 7.5 to 9, that is where you're basically using two medicines or three medicines right from the start. And again, this is a little more aggressive. And then on the right-hand side, if someone has an entry-level A1C of, of 9 and they have symptoms of diabetes, then we're going straight to insulin. And so I would say, you know, most people when they're managing diabetes with medicines, they kind of use a blend of this one as well as the American Diabetes Association. And this is the one that can be found in the Standards of Medical Care, which is released every January by the American Diabetes Association. And when you look at this one, again, the thing that makes it really hard is our first medicine is generally going to be metformin. And you see that on the screen in that very upper bar that's kind of a dark blue, or a, I don't know what color that is, dark bluish green line. So pretty much they say, okay, metformin is your first drug. But then when it comes to selecting a second drug, it's really individualized, and it depends on what is going on with that patient. And so that is what leads to the confusion. There is no clear answer on you do step one, then step two, step three, step four. It really has to be individualized. And so when we look at this one, metformin, if we can use it, it's going to be our first medicine. Our second medicine depends what's going on with the patient. If they're having atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, then we might prefer, and I'm on the left-hand column with this one, we might prefer one of the GLP-1s, which again ends in a glutide. Or we might, if they can't take that, then we might prefer one of the SGLT-2s, which ends in flozin. And from here on, I'm gonna probably use the, the, the flozin, or the, the, the last name, if you will, just to make it a little easier. Um, and so if this person, though, has heart failure or if they have chronic kidney disease, then we're going to use probably the flozins of the second-line agent if we can. And if they can't tolerate that or take that, then we might use one of the glutides. If the patient doesn't have any of that, they have diabetes, maybe some blood pressure issues, but that's about it, well, then the world is our oyster. And as long as they have good kidneys, then, you know, really we can choose any of the other age, uh, any of the agents as a second agent. And, and we'll go through, so I'm going to start this presentation off with just going through some of the basic medicine information. And then the second half of the presentation, we're actually going to look at patient cases that to, to kind of know how to apply those medicines to those patient cases. 
So some of the things that we are concerned about in terms of individualizing is the risk of hypoglycemia. You don't want your 97-year-old patient having hypoglycemia so that they fall and break a hip. Also, you don't necessarily want your patient with a BMI of 42 to be on all these medicines like insulin and pioglitazone and glipizide that can, that can make them gain even more weight. And then also just being sympathetic if someone is um, battling with insurance companies over the cost of these medicines, because unfortunately, most of them are extremely expensive. So if, if we have to consider cost as an issue, then, then we do fall to some of those older medicines. And that's on the right-hand column there. So one of the things to remember is metformin is our foundation medicine. And so when we start, I, I always ask, how do you build a building? The first thing you have to do is lay that concrete foundation. And if someone's not on metformin, you really need to ask, why are they not on metformin? And one of the big reasons why they might not be is one of the very common side effects with metformin is diarrhea. Um, and that happens with both, with, with both kind of formulations, the immediate release and the extended release. But for sure, I always ask that because it's definitely worse with the immediate release. So sometimes if someone has only ever been on the immediate release, I'll try to ask them, would you be willing to try the extended release formulation? And when we're talking about the extended release formulation, um, I usually talk to them about it being a, like a um, smoke signal. And so the extended release medicine is in a capsule. And that capsule is kind of like a plastic pillowcase. And I want them to think about it as a smoke signal. When they swallow that pill, it gets released all through the gut in a 24-hour mechanism. So that's what makes it a 24-hour release. But also, because it's being released so slowly, that is what is making it um, have less side effects as well. So if they haven't tried the extend release, for sure, I try to get them to do the extend release version. So in terms of the, the, the alcohol use, um, that is something that is it's subjective. I don't really have any guidelines as to like how many drinks per day, uh, but it can put people at an increased risk of having um, like, a, like a diabetic ketoacidosis potentially, but again, there's no good information on this. And as far as the um, as, as DKA, if they have active DKA, we won't be using it, um, but if they've recovered from that, then for sure, um, we can we can get somebody on to metformin, um, and then also unstable heart failure. And the big issue with that is um, perfusion. So if your heart's not beating very well, sometimes you can have less blood flow to the kidney. And this truly is kidney function is very important for this medicine because that is how it leaves the body. So for kidney cutoff, anybody who has a GFR, that's glomerular filtration rate more than 45, we can start it, and we can increase them all the way up to a maximum dose of 20 of two grams per day. Um, and I usually tell people when I'm starting them on it, four pills a day, because we only carry the 500s here, that is the most effective dose. And we try to get everybody that we can possibly get up to that to be on that dose. Um, if they have a GFR that's between 30 and 45, the general recommendation is if they're already on it, you can continue, but don't start it new. And you might consider a lower dose on this, so you might consider only doing one gram per day as a maximum dose. And if the GFR falls below 30, then sadly, you need to discontinue this. And I just want to mention really briefly, um, at the time I'm recording this, there is a metformin recall going on right now, and I think it is important to, to know how to talk to the public about that. And a lot of times I equate it to a hot dog recall. So when there's a hot dog recall, maybe the Ballpark Franks brand is the one that's recalled, but the Safeway hot dogs aren't. And so just let them know that Metformin is made by many different companies. And so it really depends on the company and the lot number. Um, and then it's on the pharmacy, it's the responsibility of the pharmacy to make those notifications when there is something that's being involved. 
All right, so this is a handout that will be available to you um, to download, and it's my favorite. Um, so it really helps lay out some of the different options, and especially when we get to the end part of the presentation, you'll see how I use this. Um, but if we go up to, to metformin, there you can see that it stops the leaking liver, and it's usually the first medicine that is used, even if the sugars are still pretty good. And that's true, because we use this in prediabetes. We use it in PCOS and, and women who are having trouble getting pregnant. Um, and so I like using this handout, um, and I would encourage you to download it. Um, it's in two versions that you can download the PDF in case you don't have um, the, the, program, the, the program for editing it, but I also do have the, um, the publisher version. So if you want to go in and tailor it to whatever's on your formulary or whatever medicines you're using the most, you can do that. Um, feel free to, to use it. <laughs> I have no, no rights on this whatsoever. I just really think it's very helpful. All right. So the other thing in terms of just generalization and talking about uh, the, the diabetes medicines, it's really important to understand the difference between background and mealtime medicine. So the background medicines are the, the ones that are included in that category are metformin, the long-acting insulins, and pioglitazone. The mealtime medicines are the ones that end in zide, flozin, glyptin, glutide, and then also the short-acting insulin. And then the green box at the bottom would be fixed combination insulin, such as 70-30 or 50-50. Um, and those basically fall into both categories because they have the background insulin as well as the mealtime insulin. And it's just really important to know that in more advanced diabetes, you will not get to goal by only using the background medicine. And we'll have an example of that. But you'll see it where people continually increase the background doses and they wonder why they can never get the A1C to goal. And it's because you really at some point do need to start attacking those mealtime numbers as well. So one of the categories I probably see the most is A1C over 10. And it's really important to have the conversation that you have actually been on insulin your entire life. And in fact, you were even on it before you were born. And I ask people, why is that true? And I give pause and let them think about it. And sometimes they come up with the answer of, well, because I make it. And I say, very good. Do you know where you make it? And I try to lead them. If they can't guess there, then I'll give them a multiple choice. I'll say, okay, it's either your kidney, your pancreas, or your liver. And most of the time, then they get that it's the pancreas. So there is a big stigma on insulin. Um, you are only on insulin if you are ready to die. Um, you're only on insulin if you're a failure at everything else and there's nothing else that can help you. And so we really need to break down these barriers. And people hate talking about insulin. Medical providers hate talking about insulin. And mostly because when you start talking about insulin, they probably know somebody who has been on insulin. And it's in a very emotional talk. It's not something that the docs have all the time in the world to go through and work through. So that's why I do get a lot of people referred to me that need to be started on insulin. And it's because um, they want to have that, that difficult conversation. Or they want me to have that difficult conversation. And um, there's a lot of tears. So have tissue boxes by your side too. And depending on what's going on, um, there's all different scenarios where we use diabetes or where we use insulin. But typically in someone who's new to diabetes and has this really high A1C out of the blue, one of the things that we do, um, that I do talk about is diabetes being like a wildfire. And living in the Southwest, most people know somebody on a hotshot crew or a wildland firefighting crew. And so when we talk about it being like a wildfire, I say, who do you want to fight your wildfire? Do you want the Zuni? company with only one or two engines, or do you want the hot shots and the hell attack to come in and take over your fire and get it under control? And so hopefully they say the hell attack and hot shots, and for diabetes, that is insulin. It is the medicine that we can use in the short term to get things under control. Now, later on, we might be able to, to pull it back, or we might need to keep it at a low level and then add some other things in too. But, that's, but, but insulin, a lot of times, is the one thing that will 
reverse the crisis that is going on. Um, and again, it's a hard conversation to have, um, but for sure, um, this approach has seemed to be more successful for me. And when I do start talking about using a long-acting insulin, there's a couple of versions out there, um, but regardless of which one you pick, most of the time, I like starting a long-acting insulin, and, and I generally start it at either 10 units a day or 6 units a day, and I just look at them because the bigger someone is, usually the bigger dose they're going to need. Um, but I usually just judge it, okay, your, your kind of normal body weight will start you at 6, or you're above normal body weight and we'll start you at 10. And then what I tell them, because right now they have so much going on, and a, a message that they get a lot of times from the doctors is, okay, I'm gonna start you on insulin, and now I want you to check your blood sugar in the morning when you wake up, and after breakfast, and before lunch, and after lunch, and before dinner, and after dinner, and then before you go to bed. And they can't do it, because no human being should be asked to do that. So there's a lot going on right now. So really what you wanna do is you wanna focus on the one blood sugar that is affected most by the long acting insulin. So if you can just, if they can just get one a day or even one most days, it's that morning fasting number. And I generally do either weekly phone calls or visits to do the titration. And all I'm looking for in this very early stage is to get that AM fasting into the 100s. And it's gonna be the higher 100s, but that's okay. Because generally these people have been seeing morning blood sugars in the 200 to 300 range, and they don't feel good. And the other problem with doing like a weight-based calculation on what dose to start out with insulin is if you do take somebody who's been having 400 as a morning fasting blood sugar, and you put them suddenly on 50 units of insulin, you can drop them down to the 100, but they're probably not gonna feel very good with that. And one caveat to this is, um, People, women who have gestational diabetes and are requiring insulin, we will start them off at higher doses. And it's usually because we have a very limited time that we need to get those sugars under control. And the other reason they don't seem to do too poorly on that, or they don't have too much, they have a crazy amount of insulin resistance going on. So they do tend to be able to, to tolerate those higher doses even in the beginning. So that is not covered here. That's a whole topic all by itself with gestational diabetes and management. So, so as long as when I'm doing those weekly phone calls, if I call and say, okay, hey, what are your morning fastings? And pretty much everything is above 200, then I go up by 10 units every single week. And you can do it a little quicker, too. You can do it about every five days even. Um, but um, that's how we get up to those doses and do it in a stepwise fashion so that people actually feel well on their insulin. And then once we do get to those, the, the, the AM fastings in the 100s, we look at, okay, how much insulin did that take? Because if someone was able to get to that on only 12 units of insulin versus someone who needed 80 units of insulin, it really gives me a good picture into how functional their pancreas is. Because remember, they have been making insulin their whole life. And the longer those numbers have been high and the more that pancreas has been overworking, it's going to tire out eventually. And so if they're at the point where they really just needed like a reset um, because they haven't been that high for that long, but they needed to get out of the crisis, um, if they still have a functional pancreas, it means that we have a lot more options when we start looking at other medicines and, and potentially transitioning people off of insulin. So again, there's two different types of insulin. And mealtime insulin is the kind that helps with after eating sugars and when you need to lower it quite a bit. So if you have someone who's just barely going high after, after eating, this may not be the drug that you, or the, the, the next medicine you go to. And um, the American Diabetes Association does recommend starting with like the largest meal or maybe the two largest meals of the day because it is really a big ask to have any human being take not only this medicine three times a day, but also take their long-acting insulin once or twice a day. And, um, and kind of going back to that idea of 70-30 insulin, that's a fixed combination. Um, but, but having people understand when they're on that, 70% um, of it is a long-acting and 30% is a short-acting or mealtime insulin. And the reason 70-30 is important is 
you want to make sure that there's a balance between your long acting or basal and your bolus. So if you're if you're giving somebody a lot of insulin and they're on 100 units of glargine, which is a long acting, but they're only on 10 units of aspart, which is a short acting, you're you're not you're at like a, a 90 90ish 10ish ratio. So you want to make sure you're getting to 70 30. And some people who are big carb eaters sometimes even need to go more like 50 50. And I'm talking about total daily doses here, um, not necessarily just with one meal. So just to make sure you're in the ballpark, because um, if you have this ratio off and you have them on too much bolus and or too much basal and not enough bolus, you're going to really struggle with getting them to, to goal. So there are a bunch of new medicines, and thank goodness, because we were due. Um, and I always say it's, it's, it's good to be diagnosed with diabetes now compared to even 10 years ago, because the medicines we have, um, they're really good. And, and, and it gives our, 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 our people and our family more chances of success. And so where these new medicines really shine is um, about 10 years ago, they started requiring when diabetes medicines came to market that they had to do cardiovascular trials and make sure that these medicines weren't hurting people. Um, they might be lowering sugar, but if they were causing heart attacks, that wouldn't be good either. And so, so they've required them to, to go through these very rigorous studies. And so anybody who has had a heart attack or has heart disease, the glutides have very good data. And so that's what moves them up into being that potentially the second medicine that's used. People with heart failure, we use the Flozin because they have good data with kind of acting like a water pill and helping to stabilize some of the, the things going on with heart failure. And then people who have stage kid, three kidney disease, and that could either be because their GFR is low or they have high proteins in their urine, more than 30 for the urine albumin creatinine ratio, the Flozins have good data for that too. And there will be more coming on this. Um, as they expand to do the testing to look at more of it, if it's a family effect on the medicine. So let's start off talking about those glutides. Again, um, heart disease is one of the compelling indications for this. The other thing that, that on that ADA nomogram in the middle of that, where it talked about um, if you're trying to avoid a propensity of gaining weight, well, this is one of the few diabetes medicines that does help with weight loss. And when you take this, it slows down how fast the stomach is emptying. So when you do eat, you feel fuller faster. And so with that, you know, there's some side effects that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but it's also been shown to help with kidney disease and potentially slowing the amount of protein that's being lost in the urine due to high sugars. And the people who tend to be good responders on this medicine are people who have lowish, they have, they have pretty reasonable sugars to begin with. And if they are on insulin, they're on a lowish dose of insulin, okay? They're not someone who's taking, you know, multiple daily shots a day, but it could be someone who's on maybe a long acting insulin of maybe 40 or 50 units a day or less. Um, it just says that their pancreas is more functional um, because again, you know, you make insulin and someone without diabetes, they typically make about 40 to 50 units in a day for an adult. So if someone's on that amount or lower, then you, you probably will have a good response or you may have a good response with this, but the only way you know really is to try. And just being, um, and, and, and this is one thing that it, I'm kind of not going with the guidelines when I say this, but um, it makes sense to me when you do start the glutides, you want to stop the duplicates. So the other medicines that are going to try to do the same effect with making the pancreas make more of its own insulin, and the examples of those would be the gliptins. And actually, that's the, the guidelines do say you should not use the gliptins with the, the glutides. And the reason is, is because the shot versions of these medicines, even though they both work on gut hormones, the shot versions of these are so much more powerful than what you make on your own. And the, the, the glyptins, the GPP-4 inhibitors, all they do is prevent the breakdown of what's already in your body. So basically the glutides overpower, and whereas the glyptins just preserve what you already have made. Um, and so they don't recommend those being used together. 
Um, the warning with when you're using a glutide with a sulfon and urea is that you can have uh, potential for more loads. But again, that combination does just theoretically does not make sense because you're trying to get both of them are trying to make the pancreas produce more insulin, specifically at the meal time. So, um, how do you get people to to buy into a shot? Well, for some reason, when you say there's a shot medicine that I think would be really good for you, but it's not insulin, their ears sometimes do perk up because again, it's insulin has this really um, bad stigma with it. So the glutides, they don't work by themselves. So what generally happens is when you do the shot, it just sits there and it's waiting. And what it's waiting for is a message that you've eaten. Because when you put that first bite of food into your mouth, what's happening is there's a message going to your liver and your pancreas and your, your salivary glands and your stomach. And how big the meal is depends on how big that message is. So the glutides are very smart because they actually self-adjust to the size of that message. If it's a big meal, it's a big message, and they'll work a little more big, okay, more big. Um, so um, when you do this shot, it's a once-a-day shot. It doesn't matter what time of day you take it. And some of these are, are, are daily and some are weekly. So I just have them lumped together here um, for the purpose of, of just talking about the family. Um, but the way that it works is it does signal the pancreas to make more insulin, but only after you've eaten. It also slows down the stomach. It decreases sugar from the liver, and it also decreases appetite. And so the slowing of the stomach and the decreasing appetite is what can really cause nausea. And one of the ways of working around this is just making sure when you're starting it, you're starting it at a low dose and then moving slowly with it. Um, we even, you know, we use the, the raglatide here mostly, and we even start at a dose that's half of what the company recommends as a starting dose. And we do that for a week. And um, I actually have a handout on this that you'll be able to download as well, um, specifically for liraglutide. Um, but it kind of shows you the titration process. But a lot of times I'll do weekly follow-ups with these folks too, just to make sure that they're feeling okay, because they are very expensive. So if it's someone who's dealing with insurance problems, they are probably not gonna wanna spend thousands of dollars per month on this medicine. So um, the other side effect, which kind of surprised me, but um, is happening a lot in real life is the diarrhea. Because I always thought of this as being a slowdown medicine. So if anything, it should cause constipation. But diarrhea is actually the number two side effect of this, and it usually passes. So if you start people low, go slow. If they can put up with it, usually it goes away, um, you know, even just a week into it. There's always a risk of pancreatitis, but there is a risk of pancreatitis with diabetes. So um, if someone would develop pancreatitis, generally we stop the medicine, um, and the, the advice is not to re-challenge again. I have used this though in patients who have had pancreatitis in the past, if they still have what I would consider a functional pancreas, sometimes it, they, they do fine with it. They might be at a little bit risk of, um, of, of nausea. Um, and if that is the case, generally the longer acting, the weekly glutides may actually be better choices because the nausea seems to be a little less than those. And then my favorite, thyroid cancer, because when people read this, boy, do they want to take it. Um, but the truth is, um, when they talk about thyroid cancer, it is an exceedingly rare type of thyroid cancer. So if you took 1,000 people with thyroid cancer, only one of them would have the specific type that they're talking about here. And it's never been proven in humans. It's only been in mice um, where they induced that kind of cancer. So um, it's hard to talk people off of the ledge when they hear cancer involved in the side effects, but, um, and I don't mean to downplay it, because if you're that one in a thousand, or, you know, that, that one person out of 10,000 that this happens to, it's a big deal, but um, it is exceedingly rare. All right, so now we're going to talk about the flozins, and I have a picture of a dam there, because uh, I like to explain this by, okay, you have a lake, and when that lake gets too full, what happens is they open up the spillways to get rid of the extra water. Your body does this for sugar. So when your sugar levels get too high, 
your body automatically is going to try to open up the spillways to get rid of the extra sugar. And generally, the time that your body struggles with high sugars the most is after meals. So you can kind of think of the flozins as an after meal sugar. So one thing that, that is really important to remember when you're using these medicines, you have to get to the point where you're having, you're reaching that excretion threshold, because basically the SGLT2 inhibitors or flozins, they're preventing the kidney from reabsorbing sugar back in. So in one step, your body's trying to get rid of the extra sugar and it puts it into the urine. And then your kidney is working overtime to try to save this sugar because it sees it as energy and it doesn't want to lose energy. So your kidney spends a lot of energy to reabsorb that back into the blood. And, um, but if you're not excreting it into the urine to begin with, there's nothing to prevent reabsorption of. And for sugar lowering, a GFR of 45 is definitely where this is most effective for sugar lowering. Keep in mind that the higher the sugar, the more sugar lowering you're going to have and the more side effects you're going to have. And we'll talk about those side effects on the next page. There was recently a trial that used canagliflozin called the Credence trial. And that's where they took people who were in stage three kidney disease, meaning they had a GFR between 30 or 45, or they had microalbuminuria or proteinuria. So this cutoff for kidney is lower than what any of the diabetes trials used, because the diabetes trials used 45 as their cutoff. So this is a gray zone. So for a GFR between 30 and 45, you might not have significant sugar lowering. There might be some, maybe up to an A1C of about 0.5, but it's not going to be like your over 45 GFR where you can expect a sugar lowering of somewhere between 1 and 1.5%. And also, they used the same GFR cutoff um, in the DAPA-HF trial, um, and that was interesting because that was actually a study that was done in people who did have diabetes as well as people who did not have diabetes because they were specifically looking at the heart the effects with the heart failure and saving um, people from dying from heart failure basically and what they found with that is there is quite a bit of a diuretic or a water pill effect with the, the flozen um, and again their gfr cutoff was over 30. and the thing with with the flozens is because they have a muni unique mechanism of action if your kidney function allows it, this is a really good medicine that you can add on to almost any other type of diabetes medicine. So once you have someone on really high doses of insulin and they're not at goal, but they're not crazy high anymore, this is a great thing to add on. And so we, I, I kind of hinted at the side effects and this is um, pretty well known because of all the TV commercials, um, but infections tend to be at the top of the list and that includes genital yeast infections and urinary tract infections. And then Fournier's gangrene, which is a kind of gangrene that happens in the perineum, which is the area between the urethra and the, the, the anal opening. Um, so just having people be on the lookout for any symptoms and any stinging when they pee, that's generally how urinary tract infections start. And also being aware of the water pill effect. Again, the higher the sugar, the more, and this is in the yellow box, the more lowering and the more side effects you're going to have. So I typically try to avoid this if I have people who are going higher than the mid 200s, because a lot of times they simply can't tolerate it because they're ending up in the hospital or in the clinic every every month with a urinary tract infection or a yeast infection and they can get really dehydrated too and it can really drop the blood pressure as well and i would say dehydration was a huge issue when i worked in a in a hotter when i was down in, in southern arizona you know it'd be 120 degrees outside and it's really hard to stay hydrated on a good day um with that and and then um there was a warning at one point with um canagliflozin, but it hasn't really been shown as a class effect about foot amputations being more likely with, with the flozins. Um, and that honestly probably has more to do with perfusion again than the actual drug. So when people are on this, I do tell them, you know, pay a little more attention to your feet, uh, but it's generally not something um, that I really do a, 
a whole lot of coaching on just because the risk really is very low with that. So another side effect that can happen is people can get into diabetic ketoacidosis even at normal sugars, and that's called euglycemic DKA. People who are more likely to have this happen are people who start off with double-digit A1Cs, so they're already having pretty high sugars that are putting them at risk of DKA. Or if you have someone who's losing weight already, likely due to sugars, they're already in that catabolic flow um, that is leading to DKA on its own. So using an empagliflozin can do that, can push that over the edge. And also people who are not taking a basal insulin. So being on a basal insulin protects you from somewhat from having DKA because basically DKA is a complete shutdown on insulin from your pancreas or from an exogenous source. Okay, so you have no insulin available in your body. Your muscles freak out. They do this. They they prevent all the or they produce all the ketones to get their energy because that's the only way that it can bypass um, and make its own energy. And so. Um, so I'm a little, I'm very hesitant if someone has a double digit A1C and they're not, and the reason the doc wants to use it is because they won't take insulin. It probably isn't worth the risk of the DKA or the side effects because those are the people who, again, who are gonna have the biggest side effects. All right, and so now we're gonna talk about the gliptins. And again, this falls in the category of lowering after meal sugars, but they're not super effective. So they only lower A1C by about 0.5%. And this isn't necessarily an additive lowering. So if someone is within about 0.5 of their A1C goal, so you have someone who has an A1C goal of 7, they're at 7.5, potentially you could use this. But if you're trying to take somebody from an A1C of 13.5 to 13, number one, it's not going to work <laughs> because you're already at this point where the pancreas is so freaked out, it's, it's just not producing insulin anyway. Um, but there's no way you can even come close to the goal, and it probably isn't going to do much at lowering it at all. You probably aren't even going to get to 13 just because it's simply not going to work. It does, and, and then another way to kind of phrase that, again, because we're focusing on postprandial sugars with this, so if they're within about 20 points of their postprandial goal, then this is a good time to use this medicine. So in general, if you're shooting for a postprandial goal of 180 to get to an A1C of seven, if you're staying between the 180 to 200 range, potentially you could try this. It does require a very functional pancreas. Um, and the typical people who um, that would be would be people who have a shorter duration of diabetes. Maybe they've only been diagnosed for a year or two or they're on a very low dose of basal insulin to get to that AM fasting goal in the 100s, or they're on no insulin, no exogenous insulin at all. Um, one time that I sometimes will, avoid, will go around my, um, my exception for those high numbers is when we cannot use metformin, because it does have a little bit of effect with quieting down the liver from leaking extra sugar. And so, Sometimes, especially for like a kidney, like a really low GFR, um, sometimes I will use alogliptin, but I don't usually get much effect out of it. So it's not a miracle drug by any means. And again, just be careful to avoid duplications of therapy. Um, so mealtime insulin, well, if they're on that, it already shows that your pancreas is not working very well, and this will do virtually nothing. The glipizides are way more powerful than the gliptins are. So if they're already on a glipizide, you're probably already maxing out your pancreas potential. And then again, um, I had said about the guidelines, they do not recommend a GLP-1 and a DPP-4 um, because the GLP-1, again, is way more effective. So you should be stopping the glyptin um, when you're starting a glutide. All right. So an oldie but a goodie, so the sulfonylureas, okay, and they usually end in zide or rise, so glipizide or glyburide. Again, these are after sugar lowers, um, and they stimulate the pancreas to make more insulin. So again, you need a functional in a pancreas to have this work right, but you have to have the timing right, too. So generally, you're taking this um, either right as you're going to be eating or within 30 minutes of the meal. 
um, because when you take this, it is going to make your pancreas make more insulin. And if that meal doesn't come, you are definitely setting yourself up for having a low sugar. And that's what it is famous for, for causing low sugars. But it also shows that they're very effective. And so um, when someone has a really high sugar and they are refusing insulin and you need powerful lowering, this is something that we sometimes use um, just to, to see if we can just, you know, eke out a little bit more insulin out of that pancreas. And I have there that it's not smart. So if you remember when I was talking about the gut hormones that didn't work by themselves, they were waiting for messages. So they only worked when you were eating. The sulfonylurea works as soon as you start taking it. So again, you just have to make sure that you're eating and having that timing right when you're taking those. And pioglitazone has kind of fallen off. Um, it's still on the guidelines. It's still a good medicine. Um, there actually might be more information about this being used even in like pre-diabetes to kind of reverse some of the stuff that's going on there. Um, but its main action is that it sensitizes the muscles to insulin. And we sometimes call that um, insulin resistance or um, reducing insulin resistance. And one area where there is probably quite a bit of benefit for pioglitazone is in the setting of fatty liver disease. So our liver usually should look this dark purpley red color, um, but people with diabetes and high triglycerides tend to have more of a risk of having fatty liver where it starts to look more like ground beef. Um, and pioglitazone, even though it does cause some weight gain overall, it's actually really good at lowering fat within the organ. And so if you have a fatty liver, you're trying to lower the fat within the liver. Um, and there's also some, you know, in, in, the, in the realm of prediabetes, pioglitazone may help a little bit with getting rid of some of the fat in the pancreas, which is causing the insulin dysfunction. Um, so higher doses can definitely cause um, lower leg swelling or weight gain and also weakened bones. So those are some of the side effects that have led us to not use it as widely as we did. It's still an option though. Um, and I do leave it on the table, especially, you know, when we start coming down to the end, you know, and we're trying to figure out what other options are available for patients. So one of the biggest determinants of what medicines people can take is what's their kidney function. So some of them do require good kidney function. And so those would be the metformin, the flozin, and the gliburide, and the gliburide is because it actually has an active metabolite which accumulates if you have low kidney function. Ones that you can use in low kidney function are the insulin, and a lot of times they end up being our go-to. You can still use pioglitazone. You can use glipizide, but there is always the, the, the risk of having some lows with that as well. The gliptins, all of them can be used. Some of them have to be dose reduced, not all of them. And then the glutides um, also have a lot, quite a bit of data in, in people with low kidney function. Now the backside of that handout I showed you earlier looks like this. Um, because if we're really doing comprehensive care with diabetes, we're not just handling the sugar. We're actually doing some risk reduction um, using some other medicines too. So here you'll see all the different medicines um, and again, this is our formulary, um, but you know, it starts at the top with lysinopril or losartan and how it specifically lowers kidney blood pressure. Hydrochlorothiazide or chlorothalidone, it's a blood pressure medicine. Um, the OLULs, um, those are heart medicines. So they slow down the heart. And then verapamil and diltiazem, they work on blood vessels. Amlodipine works on blood vessels. Aspirin, um, and then also the statin family. And I'm going to talk about each one of these just briefly. So the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors are the ones that, again, their last name is Pril, and the angiotensin receptor blockers are Sartans. Um, we don't use both of those together, it's either or. And the only time that we really use it is if they, there's a blood pressure that's over 140 over 90 or whatever their, their individualized blood pressure goal is. So 140 over 90 is still what ADA recommends or if they have a urine albumin to creatinine ratio greater than 30. If they have one of those, there is definite benefit in them being on this medicine. But if they don't have either one, then there's no benefit. And you're making them take a medicine that has no data to support having any benefit in them. 
you do have to be careful, especially in females of ch childbearing age, because this is a medicine that you don't want to get pregnant on. It's not the end of the world if they do, um, but it needs to be stopped immediately um, if a woman does realize she's pregnant. And then the statins. And I've kind of um, reformed the way that I talk about statins. Um, again, because if we go back to thinking of diabetes as being a blood vessel disease and not just a sugar disease, um, when you talk about statins and pre preventing heart attacks and strokes and lowering your cholesterol, some people do buy into that. Um, the populations that I work with tend to really be concerned about their kidneys. And so I really talk about the fact that statin medicines help prevent inflammation inside the blood vessels. And so when we talk about it being a blood vessel disease and trying to protect the blood vessels in the eye and the blood vessels in the kidney and the blood vessels in the feet, if we can make those blood vessels healthier and stronger, um, and that's exactly what the statins do by getting rid of that inflammation. So. Sorry, I have some overhead announcements going on. All right, and so when we talk about the statins, um, People who have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or ASCVD, they really need to be on these, and they need to be on high potency. Um, and there's a couple of different statins. These are some of the most common ones, but one thing to remember is there's only two statins that actually qualify for high potency, and that's rosuvastatin and atorvastatin. And in each one of those, it's only the two highest doses. So those are the doses that you see. If you use lower doses, then it moves it down to that middle part of the slide where it's actually a medium potency. And generally, people with diabetes between the age of 40 and 75, they, um, they use that, that, those are the doses that they would be on. Some people can't tolerate these because they will have muscle pain or weakness with it, um, you know, just random side effects. So if these don't work, you can try low potency pravastatin. Um, and you get some benefit with the inflammation from that. It definitely, though, um, isn't in the same category as the others, and it, it, it gets cleared differently. So it's more water-soluble than the others. Um, Rosuvastatin is also more wa water-soluble. So you might have less side effects with those. Again, caution in women of childbearing age, and you do not want to get pregnant on these. These are category X because you actually do create cholesterol within your body. It's one of those early things that a fetus needs. So, um, so yeah, so just be careful with that. If someone, if someone really needs this, um, then talk about birth control as well. And this is very rare but very serious. But what they have found is with the Athabascan people, specifically Navajo and Apache patients, some actually do develop HMG-CoA antibodies. Um, so if someone does present with muscle pains, you always check their CPK, that's creatinine phosphate kinase first. If it's elevated, then you want to check the, the for an antibody. It's a very expensive test because it's very specialized. Um, but if someone has that, it can be life-threatening. And I unfortunately did know one patient that that had happened to. And it's something that FDA is definitely watching. And it seems to, again, be Navajo and Apache people. All right. And for aspirin, oh, an aspirin a day keeps the doctor away, or so we thought. So if you've had a previous heart attack, then it's considered secondary prevention, and you definitely should be on aspirin. If you didn't have a previous heart attack, it's considered primary prevention, and there's likely no benefit. And it's interesting when you actually look at the data on this, because the, the trials from the 80s and 90s, when we did not use statins as much, actually was, was saying that aspirin probably did a really good job at protecting heart attacks. But now that we're using the statins a lot more for, for primary prevention, it really has kind of probably put that aspirin under the bridge, um, saying that it really doesn't help, especially if someone is using statins. All right, so now we're gonna go in to the second part of the presentation. So um, what I would say at this point is, let's take a little bit of a stretch, okay? Um, stretch out a little bit because we're going to put all that new knowledge that we, we took to work. Okay. So loosen up a little bit. Okay. All right. So we're going to go into some cases and, you know, just 
again, I, I want to kind of present this as the way that I was presenting it to a patient. Um, and some are going to have pretty clear answers and some are not. And again, remember, diabetes medicine management is more of an art because you have to individualize it. And I am a big fan that if there are two options, then offer both options to the patient. Um, so, so I'll try to do that in, in most instances. But for this case, we have a 45-year-old female, and she was just diagnosed today, and she has an A1C of 7.9. Her goal is 7. She has good kidneys, and she's currently not on any diabetes meds. So I'm going to pause for a little bit, and I want you to think about what would be the first agent that you would recommend for this patient. Okay. Okay, so hopefully your answer on this one was metformin, okay? So again, metformin, whether you're looking at the ACE nomogram or the ADA nomogram, this is generally the first medicine that we try to use. I personally wouldn't even offer her the immediate release unless she had trouble swallowing. I usually go straight for the, immediate, the extended release just because I know side effects are gonna be less and people tend to do a little bit better on that then. Um, and we would start on a dose of one tablet a day. I would tell her, most people do the best if they can get up to four tablets a day. Your kidney function's gonna allow that, so let's see if we can get up to four. And we just do it over, you know, one week she'll take one. Um, she also has the option of doing um, those tablets all at the same time. So you can actually take all your extended release at the same time. So four pills in the morning of 500 would get you to the two grams. Um, or she can split it up and do two in the morning and two in the evening. And I have people do that all the time. Um, they are big pills. Um, I've heard a lot of people say, if I, if, I, if I swallow all those pills at the same time, I won't have any room for food. Um, I guess I have a bigger appetite than they do. Okay. All right. Um, oh. oh, boy. Okay, hold on. I have to get back into my sharing mode here again. Um, oh boy. Sorry, I thought it would let me jump. Oh boy. Okay, bear with me for just a moment here. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, I guess I need to, I'm not going to use that annotating because I'm going to have to do it each time, I guess. Um, so we're going to move on to our second uh, case right now. And so we have a 56 year old male and he has good kidneys again. So he has a GFR of over 60 and he's taking metformin IR a hundred or sorry, a thousand twice a day. And he's taking glipizide five twice a day. His most recent A1C was 7.5 and his goal is 7%. But when you're talking to him, he says he does take his glipizide as prescribed, but he's only taking the metformin as 500 daily because any more than that, and he gets run to the toilet diarrhea. So hopefully, I'm going to pause for a moment and see what you can come up with this one. So hopefully, you came up with the fact that we're going to do metformin in the extended release version. And again, what I would do is I would start him on 500 milligrams a day, and then I would slowly increase him up to two grams a day if we can. But someone who's already had a bad experience like this, I'm definitely going to go slower than I normally would. Oh, 
Okay, so this is a 45-year-old male, and he's seen in the emergency room, has good kidneys. His weight was about 80 kilograms, but he recently lost about five pounds pretty quickly and unexpectedly. They haven't done an A1C for a while, and the last one was about two years ago, and it was fine, but his A1C now is 13.2, and his blood sugar was over 400. He currently is negative for blood and urine ketones. I'm going to pause a little bit, think about what you would, you would use in this case. And hopefully your answer on this one was to get him started on insulin. Now in the short term, while he's in the emergency room, he's going to be getting IV insulin and he's going to be getting some hydration as well, okay? But this is one of those situations of the wildfire that I was talking about. And because this happened probably pretty abruptly, there is a good chance that this is the kind of person that we can start insulin in, like get those numbers down fairly quickly, and the pancreas might actually start functioning better again once it's out of crisis mode. It doesn't really matter that he's negative for, for ketones. Like obviously when the sugar is this high, the only thing that is going to get that sugar down is insulin. And usually these people are pretty sick, so they don't fight you too, too much. Um, and they're also usually the people that when they come in or when, when they are brave enough to start insulin, they come in and they're like, when, after they've been on it for about a week or so, they say, I am feeling so much better um, and I have so much more energy than I did. Okay, so here we have a 66-year-old female. She's on hemodialysis, so bad kidneys. Um, A1C of 8.5 and her goal is less than 8. And right now, she's prescribed to take Glargine 12 units a day and Aspart 6 units a day with dinner. But she's actually been having some lows after dinner, so she sometimes does skip her Aspart insulin. I'm going to pause here a second, and I want you to think a little bit about what she is on and maybe what we might be offering her. Hopefully you have some good ideas. Um, the thing that I really kind of wanted to highlight with this one, though, is number one, bad kidneys, but also she's on very low doses of insulin. So this is someone who has a pretty func functional pancreas. Um, so we do have a couple of options here. Um, first off, I would probably stop her aspart insulin because she's skipping it sometimes anyway. Um, and, you know, she's within 0 0.5 of her A1C goal. And, and this is the point where I was going to use the writing on the screen. Um, I'm going to try it one more time. We'll see if this, this works or not. Um, so, so basically, um, with the metformin, we can't use that because of her kidneys. And we can't use EMPA because of her kidneys. We could potentially use alloglyptin because she's within 0 0.5 of her goal. And it clearly, she's already on something to help with long-acting, the, the background sugars. So she might just need a little bit of a boost um, for, doing, um, for doing the, the after-meal sugars. We could use liraglutide, okay? So this would be a once-a-day shot. She could do it at the same time she's doing her glargine shot. So that might actually be a good, um, a good way of doing it. Um, and getting some mealtime coverage. We could use glipizide. We cannot use glyburide, but we could use glipizide. And then we also could use pioglitazone, okay? So, um, so this would be one of those cases where I would probably give the patient the option of a couple different things. Stopping the short acting, continuing the long acting, and then doing maybe one of the, and, and actually, I wouldn't necessarily say the pioglitazone because if she's needing after meal coverage, it's going to be the glipizide, the glutide, or the glyptin that's actually going to give that after meal um, coverage. Okay. All right. I'm not sure how to. Let me see if I can erase. Clear all drawings. Okay. All right. Um, so now we have a 70-year-old female. She has an A1C of 
a GFR of 43, and she has an adverse drug reaction of having swelling from pioglitazone. So right away, we're going to cut out pioglitazone. She's already ordered for metformin, and if you look at her GFR, she is in that range where it's 30 to 45. Um, so this is actually a dose that she can continue on. That's fine. She's also prescribed to have 10 units of glargine every day. But what she's actually taking is just the metformin. Because when she comes to see you, she says, I don't care what that doctor says, I am not taking any shots ever. Okay, so I'm gonna pause again, and I want you to come up with some ideas of things that we could potentially offer her. And the way I'm gonna use this handout is how I do it with patients, basically. I, I, I sit down with this paper and I actually cross off. So, okay, if we're not gonna do shots, then this one's out and this one's out, okay? She's already on metformin, so we're gonna continue with that. She's in a range where um, she might not have as much sugar lowering with empagliflozin, but we could potentially use that. She was having some swelling from pioglitazone, so it potentially could help a little bit with the water pill effect and helping with some swelling. Um, Alogliptin, she's over that 0.5 above her goal, so that's probably not gonna work very well. Um, and then we could offer her glipizide also, and that would help with the mealtime sugar. She would just have to time it a little bit more. Um, you know, so, so the benefits of doing metformin with EMPA might be both are oral pills that you can take once a day. The metformin um, glipizide combination, she would probably have to take the glipizide twice a day, okay? So. Okay. All right, so now we have a 64-year-old female, she has a GFR of 57. Um, she's having some painful swelling in her ankles at the end of the day. Um, so she's on metformin, um, ER two grams daily, she's on glargine 50 units daily, pioglitazone 45 daily, and the raglatide 1.8 daily. Um, her A1C right now is 9.5. Okay, so I'm gonna pause a little bit again um, so that you can kind of come up with some thoughts on, on where we're going with this one. She's already on a lot of stuff, so what are we going to do? Okay. So one thing that we definitely want to bring up is the fact that she's having swelling and she's on full dose pioglitazone. So regardless of what we do next, we probably want to see if we can get her on a lower dose of that or even potentially stop it. It does have a, a couple of weeks of a run out though. So if you stop it now, the swelling probably won't be a whole lot better until about four to six weeks later. Um, but that for sure would be something that we would want to make sure that we're decreasing her pio. Um, so we need more lowering. And at this point, it's hard to know because, you know, you don't have the full case. Um, she's already on metformin. Um, she's already on long-acting insulin. We might need to maximize, or like make that, um, we might need to maximize the dosing on that. Um, and she's already on liraglutide. So because she's on liraglutide, Oops, that was supposed to be a check mark. We do not want to use alogliptin because she's already on the GLP-1, okay? Um, her creatinine clearance here, the 57, um, we could potentially use empagliflozin, okay? So this is a good option. So we might offer that to her. Um, She's already on the liraglutide, so we probably would not use glipizide because, again, the liraglutide is probably going to work better, okay? So really, at this point, it's going to be empagliflozin or if she needs other mealtime coverage, maybe that was supposed to be a circle around that. Maybe she needs to be on short-acting insulin, okay? 
And so a lot of times when people start on the glutides, I stop the short-acting insulin. But if someone needs to have a little bit more meal coverage, I might add in a short-acting insulin, maybe with the biggest meal of the day. All right, so this is one of those cases of like, I would basically lay out, and I, I usually draw on the handout to show patients, okay, you're already on these things and we're kind of running out of options. So especially when you're having that insulin conversation, sometimes it's very helpful for them to realize, oh my gosh, this might be the only option that I have. All right, so now we are going to have a 40 or sorry, a 59 year old female. She had a heart attack two years ago. Her A1C is 10.3, her GFR is 45, and she's prescribed metformin 2 grams daily, glargine 25 daily, and glipizide 5 DID. So um, think about her past medical history, and um, I'll pause for a few moments to see if you can come up with what we're getting at here. Okay, so hopefully what you're thinking is hopefully your mind is going over here to liraglutide. Okay, so remember that the glutides and the flozins are the two medicines that have some good information about protecting hearts. Okay, so um, generally if it's a heart attack kind of issue, we think of glutide. If it's a heart failure kind of issue, we'll think more of the flozin. Okay. So just one thing to, to note on this, if you were going to start a glutide, then I would stop the glipizide because it has that duplicate action, okay? So um, if we were just doing the empagliflozin, then we would leave the glipizide on and add the empagliflozin on top of it, okay? Um, they're already on metformin. They're already on a long-acting insulin. Um, we could do a short-acting insulin. That's a possibility. Um, the A1C is too high, so alloglyptin won't work. Um, already on glipizide, so that's already on that one. And then with pioglitazone, um, not on that, but it, it, it's not known for having the best heart data. Um, so I probably would take that one off the table too, um, just because of um, it can actually worsen heart failure, even though that might not be an issue here for this patient. Um, but really, my next steps would be looking at these two. And again, offer to the patient, see what they're willing to do. Um, people who are typically already on a once daily shot, it's not that much of a jump to get them to use a liraglutide or a once weekly injectable. Um, it's the people who aren't on shots already that you're gonna have a little bit more trouble um, getting them to buy into it. Um, but like I said, a lot of times if you say, hey, we wanna try this medicine, but it's not insulin, they sometimes will buy, buy into it as well. Okay, so now we have a 53-year-old female, or old male. Um, he has chronic kidney disease stage three because his GSR is 43 and is a UACR of 2,300. And remember, anything over 300 means there's permanent damage that has happened. So an A1C of 9.3, and he's currently prescribed metformin, 1,000 milligrams ER. Um, and, and again, that's something that is appropriate for that GFR. You want to, so he's in that range of he's already on it. We wouldn't start it in somebody on this, um, but he's in that range of 30 to 45, so we can certainly continue him at a, at a middle dose. He's on glargine 50 units a day, and then he has aspart insulin 10 units with the first meal of the day and 20 units with the second meal of the day because he's only eating twice a day. All right, so let's pause a little bit and see where we want to go with this guy. Okay, and let's just work our way around again. So he's on metformin, an appropriate dose. He's on a long-acting insulin. Um, He's on a short-acting insulin, okay? Now, empagliflozin, remember how I said that it actually has been studied in GFR of, and actually it's, it's just, the, it's, it's the, it was actually canagliflozin that was studied in there, but they're assuming it's gonna be a class effect. Um, but with canagliflozin, 
what they found was between 30 and 45 mils per minute, it actually did help with the progression of chronic kidney disease. So this is definitely an option that we could consider. Um, Alloglyptin is not an option. Hopefully you recognize he's above 0.5 of his goal, so it's probably not going to work much. Um, so this is someone that potentially we could try liraglutide on, okay? Now if we did this, again, what I would do probably though is I probably would see how he does off of his mealtime insulin to see if his, his pancreas is functional enough. Um, just getting him up to a dose on the liraglutide. So he might lose a little bit of control in the first week as we're trying to get him up to a treatment dose. Um, but, you know, it, it's a pretty short amount of time. Um, and you don't necessarily have to stop the aspart, but, it, but the, the glutides really have not been tested with the short-acting insulin. Um, and it's because, again, that you're really relying on having a functional pancreas. And this person is probably on a little bit higher of a dose, so this probably would not be my, my top choice. Um, and he's already on short-acting insulin, so he's probably past the point of using um, one of the sulfonylureas. Um, and he potentially could be on pioglitazone, um, but that would be, you know, basically if, if he was resistant to using um, the other medicine. But that also would not be my first choice. So really in this one, Probably the thing I would probably put the, my biggest sales pitch on would be the empagliflozin, and it's because of the known benefit of some members of the flozin family for helping to prevent kidney disease. And again, kidneys are a big deal. So um, people a lot of times will, um, will buy into that. Even so when you hear all the horrible side effects with yeast infections and UTI, sometimes they'll still buy in. So don't, don't just discount it. All right, now we have a 72-year-old male. His GFR is 17 mils per minute. So he is someone who's kind of nearing dialysis. He has a BMI of 35, so he's overweight. He has an A1C of 9.4, and right now he's prescribed 70-30 insulin, 50 units in the morning and 60 units in the PM. And now we probably see the combination insulins being used less, but there are places where it does potentially make sense. So people who have really hard time getting multiple daily shots in, it kind of is a middle road. It's a good way of getting bolus insulin with basal insulin um, and, and not making them do four shots a day. Um, so it's hard to really nail them down to get them to a really tight control though, okay? So um, the one thing that, um, that we could potentially, and, and actually let me pause for just a little bit, and I'll give you a little more time on this one, because this, this is a little bit more difficult here. Again, I'm just going to start up here in the corner. Can't use metformin because of that GFR of 17. Um, we would not start it if he was less than um, 45. Um, he's already on insulin, both long and short acting. Okay, and by all means, if this guy loves 70-30 and he thinks it's just a matter of his doses aren't tuned in right, we certainly can change the doses on that. I am never one to be like you have to be on basal bolus or like basal and bolus separately. Um, but sometimes it does make sense. So, so that potentially could be another option where maybe we put them on a once daily long acting insulin, um, which if we totaled it up, it would be 50 plus 60 and then we multiply by 70%. So it'd be, I'm doing rough math here. It's probably about 74%, 74 units um, as, a, as a once daily shot. Um, the pens go up to 80 units in a dose. Um, vials, you can go up to 100 units in a dose. And beyond that, then we start to split it. Um, I usually only split long-acting insulins when you are going over 100 units in a day, um, just because, believe it or not, the more you're giving in a shot, the more depot effect it has, and actually the longer lasting it is. So, um, so if you're giving 80 units once a day, you're going to have pretty close to 24-hour coverage with that. Um, so we could split them out. We could do maybe a long acting once a day, and maybe we could do a short acting with maybe the two biggest meals of the day. Um, 
And again, that short acting would be you total up the daily dose. Um, so he's doing um, so 30% of 50. Um, my calculator because I don't do math in my head. So that would be about 15 units of a, of a rapid acting with the first meal. Um, and then with 60, if I do 30% of that, it would be about 18 units. So that's what I would put um, as a starting point for my short acting insulin. All right, so getting back to our handout, his GFR is 17. You should not use the flozins in anything less than 30 for sure. His A1C is 9.4, so he's not really in the realm of, of using the, the glyptin. Now this could potentially be one of those situations though because we can't use the metformin. Maybe you would get a little bit out of that, but not much at all, okay? Um, so I'd be a little hesitant on this. Um, potentially, we could try liraglutide, um, and that would be, you know, maybe continuing with the long-acting insulin and trying him on a glutide. Um, and one of the reasons for that is if it was someone who had a pretty significant cardiac history, you would try to get them onto this anyway. So, so that potentially would be the case. Um, and I probably would try him off of the short-acting insulin in the meantime and see how he does with those two. Um, potentially, probably not much because looking at the doses on the, the glipizide, he probably is a little too, his pancreas is too, a little too burnt out, so this probably wouldn't do much. I'm actually going to cross that one out because I probably wouldn't even pitch that one unless there was big resistance to these other options. And then with the pioglitazone, again, um, maybe, um, but probably not. So, so looking at, so this, again, this is an instance where there's not a correct answer. Like, there's a lot of possibilities. Probably the one that I would push for the most would be separating out the long and the short-acting insulin. Um, and then that, that's, that's probably the one I would put as number one. Number two would probably be tweaking the 70-30 so he can stay on what he's comfortable on. Um, and then these others are kind of a toss-up because none of them are probably going to be super effective. If he was really obese, which he is, so he, he actually has an, a BMI of 35, so there might be some benefit in doing that combination of the long-acting insulin with the glutide to see if he can lose a little bit of weight. Okay, so this is the kind of slide to drive you absolutely crazy just to prove that there is not one right answer <laughs> and hence the confusion on all of this. Okay, so now we're going to move on to a 40-year-old male. Um, he has a GFR of 60 mils per minute. He has an A1C of 10.3 and he's prescribed metformin 2 grams a day and glargine 100 units a day. So again, I'm going to pause. Think about what you would do. Okay, so this is um, one of those situations where I had said before, you know, someone who's had diabetes for a while um, and they're on pretty high doses. So this guy is not on anything to help with meal times right now. So he, it's going to be really hard to get him anywhere close to goal because we are not addressing his meal time. Okay, so he's um, he's already on metformin um, on an appropriate dose. So we're going to continue that, and he's already on long-acting insulin, so we can continue that. Um, we definitely could do short-acting insulin. Um, and maybe starting with the largest meal of the day, because maybe it's just dinner time when things are going a little a little wacky. Um, empagliflozin might be an option here too. Okay, if he has good kidney function. He's a little high for me wanting to go straight to empagliflozin. I might, you know, see if um, if there's something else we can do to get his sugars down first before we we go to that. And so I probably would try to see if he's willing to start a short acting insulin before we would add the empagliflozin. Um, he's way too high for alloglyptin. Remember, that only lowers by about 0.5. Um, he could potentially use a glutide, okay? Now, he is on a pretty high dose of insulin, though, so we don't know how much 
this will, so we don't really know how functional his pancreas is. He's on 100 units, so he's on more than what somebody who doesn't have any insulin resistance and potential pancreatic burnout would be on. Um, but if his main thing is that he's eating a lot and maybe we need to curb his appetite a little bit and have him eat less carbs, potentially we can go after the appetite effects on this to see if that can, can help. Um, glipizide is going to be a big question mark too. Um, and mostly because, um, again, we don't know how much his pancreas is working and this one doesn't have that same appetite suppression. So I'm going to change my mind to make that one actually be an X because you probably aren't going to get much benefit out of this seeing that insulin dose. And then the pioglitazone, if you remember, that's a background medicine. We don't necessarily need another background medicine right now. We really need to address the meal time. So, so the two big places that I'd be, you know, or that I'd be putting some energy into to talking is the short-acting insulin, get that going, bring the sugars down a little bit, then add in the EMPA, or we could add in the, <clears throat> the liraglutide and see where we go on that. If it doesn't bring down the after meal sugars enough, we could always add short acting or EMPA on top of that. Okay. All right. So again, no one right answer. Okay. And we're kind of coming a little more toward the end here. You'll be happy to hear that. Um, so now we have a 49 year old female a GFR of 60, A1C of 9.2, but her goal is 8. She has fatty liver, and she's on metformin. And it's only 1,500 milligrams, but that's the highest she can tolerate, because any more than that, and her stomach goes crazy. She's on glargine, 34 units a day, liraglutide, 1.8 milligrams a day, and EMPA, 25 milligrams a day. So let's think a little bit on this one, what we might So let's go through it. She's already on metformin appropriately, okay? Um, she's already on long-acting insulin. She's not on short-acting insulin. We could use that one. Um, she is already on EMPA. Um, her alloglyptin, she's already on a GLP-1, so we would not use this. And there's that GLP-1 right there. Because she's already on the GLP-1, we wouldn't use this one. And so we potentially could use pioglitazone too, um, but, um, and the thing that, that I, I, so the reason I had put this in, again, that's the one time that I, I tend to, to promote pioglitazone a lot more. Um, and so the pioglitazone may actually help with her fatty liver in the long run. Whereas the short-acting insulin will definitely bring it down. Um, oh, I'm sorry, she's already on the reglutide. Um, so the short-acting insulin might bring it down. Um, but it's not necessarily going to help with the fatty liver. Um, so, but, but those would be two options that you could offer her. Because, um, again, she might hear the side effects about weight gain with pioglitazone, and nobody really wants that, so she might decide that's not where she wants to go either. Um, all right. Okay, so that is it. So I covered a lot. And I hope that you took away some pieces because I really wanted this to be um, application. And so just going through the thought process. And I really do encourage you to use that handout when you're talking about medicines with patients and go through and figure out what makes sense. Because um, diabetes is hard enough. If we don't have people on the right medicines to set them up for success, we're not doing anybody any favors. Um, so this is my information. Um, my email address and my phone number. Um, so if you do have questions following this presentation, certainly give me a shout out um, and I'll try to do my best to answer. Okay, so I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.